You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. I spotted a few tweets last Tuesday from Lovecast listeners upset that they would have to wait a whole week to hear my thoughts on the Nashville Statement. The Nashville Statement, if you missed the news, is a brand spanking new manifesto cranked out by old evangelical Christian leaders, all the usual suspects, that for all the news it made, Nashville Statement trended on Twitter for two days. It didn't actually tell us anything we don't already know about right-wing evangelical Christians. The Nashville Statement condemns, quote, homosexual immorality and transgenderism, premarital sex for straights, pre- and postmarital sex for everyone else, and funnily enough, polygamy and polyamory, which the authors of the Nashville Statement described as unbiblical, which anyone who's ever read the Bible knows is bullshit. The God of the Old Testament, the God evangelical Christians lean on to justify their hatred of LGBT people, that God, he approves of polygamy. Indeed, there are whole chunks of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy that read like a Bronze Age polyamory for dummies. God orders men to take more than one wife. Moses had three wives. Solomon had 300 wives. The God of the Old Testament, that dude, also approves of slavery and murdering your own children and other people's children, just for the record. The God of the New Testament, in another bit of awkwardness for right-wing evangelical Christian leaders, approves of loving your neighbor, not judging others, and paying your fucking taxes. Anyway, if you're a listener to The Gist, Slate's daily podcast hosted by Mike Pesca, you didn't have to wait a whole week to hear what I thought of the Nashville statement because I guest hosted The Gist on Thursday while Mike was on vacation. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me and went off, as the kids used to say, on the Nashville statement. I'm a Gist listener. You should be a Gist listener, too. But for those of you who aren't, here's a quick recap. People were literally drowning in their homes in Houston on Tuesday, the nation's fourth largest city underwater, but evangelical Christian leaders weren't going to let something as inconsequential as mass human suffering distract them from the two things Jesus cared about so much but said literally nothing about during his loquacious as fuck stay here on earth. That would be hot, sweaty, gay sex and trans people needing to pee. As a gay person, reading the Nashville Statement was like getting flipped off by someone who's been yelling fuck you in your face for 40 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I know already. You don't like me. Tell me something I don't know. But in the silver lining department and maybe in the didn't know that department, evangelical Christian leaders are no longer pushing, it seems, the Jesus can make gay people straight big lie. The Nashville Statement invites homos to, quote, walk in purity with Jesus. They're inviting us to be single and celibate, not straight. They want us to stop sucking dicks because the thought of men sucking each other off keeps Tony Perkins, National Statement Signatory, up at night. And they want us to stop getting gay married because all those hot gay honeymoon blowjobs keep Tony Perkins up at night. Instead, they want us to start, quote, living a rich and fruitful life, pleasing to God, which means gay and celibate and single. This is actually a teensy-weensy sign of progress. Right-wing Christian bigots spent decades and millions of dollars, money that could have been spent feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, caring for the sick, but whatever. They spent millions of dollars pushing the idea that Jesus could turn gay people straight. Now they're pushing the idea that Jesus can maybe inspire some gay people to live lives devoid of romance, sex, love, and commitment. They've moved from Jesus can make you straight to Jesus can't make you straight, but he might be able to make you lonely and miserable. Sounds like a lousy deal to me, but hey, nice to see evangelical leaders acknowledge the immutability of homosexuality. Baby steps. Also nice to see within 24 hours of the publication of the Nashville Statement, which was signed by 150 assholes like Tony Perkins, quote, more than 1,000 Christian leaders, pastors, theologians, and advocates signed a 10-point document titled Christians United in Support of LGBT Inclusion in the Religious Community, a response to the Nashville Statement, as the advocate reported. The national statement has been roundly mocked. I have done my part, but we got to take it seriously because it's not just a statement of belief. It is a statement of intent. This is political, not personal. This is politics, not faith. Because if we're talking about faith, people are free to believe whatever they want to believe. 
But freedom of belief isn't what the folks behind the Nashville statement are after. They want power. They want the power to impose their beliefs on others. They want their sincerely-ish held religious beliefs, their religious convictions, their biases and bigotries to have the force of law. They're not content to live in a world where gay people are free to marry and they're free to not get gay married and disapprove of gay people who do, or a world where trans people are free to be themselves and they're free not to transition and free to disapprove of people who do, or poly people are free to love more than one partner at a time and they're free to love just one partner at a time and free to disapprove of poly people. No, they want to return us to a world where they're free to persecute queer people with impunity. We're not going to let that happen. The signatories of the Nashville Statement, I say this. Like your Lord and Savior, that world is dead and gone. All right, coming up on today's show on both the micro and magnum Savage Love Casts, I chatted with Andrew Gerza, who specializes in sex and disabilities. Then on the magnum, Jesse Baring, author of Why Is the Penis Shaped Like That, comes on to talk about, well, what else? Penises and why they're shaped like that. And is the size and shape of a penis genetically heritable? In other words, penis havers, does your dick look like your dad's dick? You have to subscribe to the Magnum version of the show to find out. You can do that at www.savagelovecast.com. Today's episode of the Lovecast is brought to you by 5-4 Club, fashionable men's clothing curated and sent right to your door. Get 50% off your first package at 5-4 Club when you use the offer code SAVAGE. Just go to 5-4 Club, spell it out, F-I-V-E-F-O-U-R-C-L-U-B.com, and use the offer code SAVAGE. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Thrive Market, the new convenient way to get the highest quality natural organic groceries delivered to your door. Try it for free for 30 days and get an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. Thanks to Audible for supporting the Savage Lovecast. For a free 30-day trial, go to audible.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I'm a pansexual, genderqueer, female sex person from Oregon. I'm 20, and I started having sex with this guy about two years ago. Um, so he fell in love with me, but the feelings weren't mutual and I've, I've never been in love with him, but I really, I like spending time with him a lot and I love fucking him. We have very good sex. <laughs> We're really sexually compatible. And I think it's because we have, um, complimenting kinks plus he has a huge, beautiful penis so that that doesn't hurt the situation. So we have sporadically had sex since we first got together. And it's been sporadic because I'm often out of state for school, but also because historically he has had a hard time emotionally when we hook up because he has wanted like a deeper relationship. And I know that I just like emotionally can't provide that for him. So about six months ago, he ended things in the most definite way that he has to date, saying that he just like can't have casual sex anymore. And of course, like I respected and understood that, but privately I mourned the loss of his beautiful, beautiful cock. So recently when I was back in town, he texted me asking to hang out just as friends. And I asked if he was sure he wanted to do that because he's found it pretty difficult emotionally to just hang out as friends in the past. And he like, he assured me that that's what he wanted to do. So we hung out um, and had sex, of course. But when it first started, I checked in with him and I asked like if he was okay with this. And he assured me that like, yes, he was fine with this. He was like in a different place in his life with our relationship and with all that so yeah the sex was great and I reunited with his amazing penis great and afterwards I checked in with him and again he said he was totally fine and just you know doing what he wanted to and that was healthy but he didn't really like touch or come afterwards which may be because like the vibe was more friendly than romantic but it, it felt weird and also, he didn't text me for weeks afterwards. And when I texted him asking to hang out platonically, his response was just one line saying that he was on a trip visiting his family. So 
is it moral of me to seek out sex with him in the future if I have a strong suspicion that it is difficult on him emotionally because I would love to have sex with him again. Right before I sat down to record this week's show, I was dinking through the Savage Love inbox, Savage Love emails, which is 90% of my job. And there was a a letter from a, a woman who basically gets to this. Our sex life has always been lacking, but I thought once we live together in his home city, this might improve. This is typically how it works. People are in a relationship and the sex is lousy, but there's a great emotional connection and they try, they try, they try, they try to make the relationship work because the emotional connection is so great. And oddly enough, this never happens in the reverse. There's never a case where I get a letter from someone who says, the sex is so awesome that I've stuck it out and stuck it out and stuck it out and tried to make the emotional relationship side of this thing work and it's still not working what should i do but the sex is so great and i'm just really curious why this doesn't happen in that way now there are people who can't quit someone there's people who keep circling back and having sex with someone who's bad for them and they know it and i'm not referring to to that particular dynamic i'm referring to people getting themselves into relationships where the sex is awesome or sticking it out because the sex is awesome in a relationship that's functional not that the guy's bad or awful or that she's bad or awful but just not quite there there's not quite the connection that they hoped for And yet they're sticking it out because the sex is great. And they're hoping the emotional thing will kick into gear. Never happens that way. But it happens constantly in the reverse where the relationship is great. There's a strong emotional connection, but the sex is lousy and people stick it out forever, hoping sexual compatibility will somehow come in time. If you're in this circumstance now, I'm here from the future to tell you that it will not come in time. Sexual compatibility is there or it is not. In very rare cases, it can be manufactured. You can hammer sexual compatibility together. That is the exception to the rule. Anyhow, I'm just curious, caller. I, I, you're young. You're only 20 years old. Perhaps you're not ready to settle down. I'm just curious if the sex is so awesome and his cock is so amazing and ginormous and delicious and stunning and flabbergasting and supercalifragilisticexpialidociousing. Why aren't you trying to make the emotional side work? Why would I would be tempted if I were you if the sex was this great to try to make the emotional side work. But that's not your question, and so we're going to leave that by the side of the road. Your question is, can you, in good conscience, continue to fuck this guy knowing that for you it's just about the dick and the sex and for him, there's feelings. And fucking you and knowing that for him there are feelings there. And so you're toying with his emotions perhaps because he may be arriving at sex, not just anxious to get at your amazing genitals uh, in the same way you're anxious just to get at his amazing genitals, but hoping that perhaps if you guys keep fucking long enough that you will catch feelings for him in the same way that He has caught feelings for you. If you know for certain that you will never catch feelings for this guy, that you are never going to stick it out and hope the relationship works because the sex is so great, you can't in good conscience continue to fuck this guy because you're setting him up for a painful fall. You're setting him up for more pain than he's already experienced in this relationship with you. And why? Because you want to jump on his giant, amazing, beautiful cock. Well, there are other giant, amazing, beautiful cocks out there in the world and you could get busy finding another one. His isn't the only one. And then not have to risk inflicting more pain on this guy than that that you've already inflicted, that has already been inflicted on him by this circumstance. It's not your fault that you didn't end up feeling for him in the same way that he felt for you. But now that you know that there is this disconnect, the onus is on you not to exploit him, not to intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or subconsciously leverage his feelings for you against him to get, keep his dick coming. So yeah, you have to cut this off. All that said, he fucked you. There wasn't a lot of cuddling afterwards and you didn't hear from him for weeks. And then you texted him and you got a one line response saying out of town. Sounds like he's not up for fucking you ever again. Sounds like he got what he needed or got what he wanted from that encounter and he is done. So this is much more, I think a hypothetical question than you realize. I have a confession to make. I am a workaholic. Ask anyone who knows me and they will confirm it. I am pretty much always working and I kind of love working and love being busy, but you know what I don't love? AKA hate shopping for clothes. I simply don't have time for it. I don't have that particular gay gene. I intensely dislike shopping. So if you like me, 
don't like to shop, you're going to want to check out 5-4 Club. Each month they send you a curated box of two to three items, hand-picked to match the current season and your style. They've been helping men with fashion for over 15 years and shipped to over 100,000 men every month. And they know what they are doing. So if you don't, that's okay. 5-4 Club will help you build your wardrobe one month at a time. And having nice-looking clothes, nice-looking pants helps you feel confident. And feeling confident in your pants is going to help you get into other people's pants. That's just science. When you use 5-4 Club, you get $120 worth of clothes for just 60 bucks a month. You can pause or cancel anytime with no commitments. And as a 5-4 Club member, you'll also receive up to 50% off items in their online shop and access to exclusive members-only items free shipping, and size exchanges. Go to 54club.com right now and enter promo code SAVAGE and they'll give you 50% off your first month's package plus a free pair of sunglasses. That's 50% off your first package at 54club, spelled F-I-V-E-F-O-U-R-C-L-U-B.com, promo code SAVAGE. 54club.com, promo code SAVAGE. Hi, Dan. 31-year-old straight male calling from the UK and longtime listener. I broke up with my 30-year-old girlfriend two months ago after five years together. The relationship was going well, and we had a great connection, but she really wanted to start a family in the next two to three years. We had talked about this before, and I felt ambivalent about having kids in the near short term. I know I want to have kids at some point, but two to three years feels too soon, and my preference would be to wait a bit longer. Due to a chronic medical condition, her doctors have encouraged her to have a kid sooner rather than later for several years now. She's gotten more and more concerned about this recently. She gave me an ultimatum, fully expecting me to move up my timelines for children. After an agonizing decision, my feeling was that I could not guarantee wanting kids in such a short period of time. What would happen if in two years, I realized I actually really needed another few years? Ever since this decision, we have had no contact. I've been incredibly sad, can't sleep properly at night, and miss her every single day. I had no desire to be single as my relationship was very fulfilling, happy, and I could see a great future together. It's been hard to process everything, and I've been doubting my decision. How do I know if I should throw caution to the wind, marry this girl, and move up my timelines for children? Based off your experience, which decision do people regret more? Breaking up or having a kid earlier than they would have liked? So you're 31 years old, and your girlfriend, who you love very much, your ex-girlfriend, who you miss very much, is 30 years old. And she has a medical condition. Her doctors have advised her to uh, have kids sooner rather than later. And you want kids too. So it's not kids or no kids. You're not being asked to compromise about whether or not to have kids. You're not being issued ultimatums about to be with me, you've got to have kids even though you don't want to have kids. You're just being asked to accelerate the kid timeline a bit. And your answer was – Fuck you. Your answer was no way. Your answer was goodbye. So you're 31 now and the ultimatum was kids in the next two to three years. So you would have been 34, maybe even 35 by the time she had kids. You say you want kids. Maybe you want kids in nine years. Maybe what is your timeline? What, what's your preferred timeline? You want to wait till you're 40? To have your first kid? Okay, well, your girlfriend's 30, so you're asking her to wait till she's 39 or 40. Even if she had no medical condition, asking her to wait till she's 39 or 40 ups the odds of her not being able to conceive or the conception being extremely difficult, even in the absence of a medical condition. So this seems to me like a compromise that you should have been willing to make. The compromise between 35 and 40 upping it five years, having kids a little sooner than you might have liked or might have hope to or you then you ideally would have liked to because why because for shits and giggles because there was an eclipse because brexit no because the woman that you love for her to have kids for you two to have kids together you're gonna have to do it sooner because medical condition because doctor's advice Casting her back out into the dating pool to start over again to find someone to have kids with or putting her in a position where she's probably contemplating having kids on her own. This all seems to me a little selfish and a little short-sighted as if you're fixated on your life plan as it existed before you met and fell in love with this particular woman. We often have to adjust our life plans and what we wanted and when we thought we wanted those things based on the people we are with the people that we fall in love with, the people we can see ourselves having a future with. Sometimes you have to make accommodations and adjustments. 
And this seems like a reasonable accommodation to make because we're talking shaving a few years off to accommodate her medical condition and recognizing that waiting as long as you might like to wait may result in, even if she had no medical condition, there being complications or problems that your original idea about how long to wait was perhaps unreasonable. And so, yeah, I think you fucked up by breaking up with this woman, by not accepting that maybe the universe or fate or whatever woohoo you want to invoke had a different idea about when kids would come into your life. And that's why fate sent this woman into your life, a woman you miss very much, a woman you should call on the phone, a woman you should apologize to and say that you've given this another think and that you're willing to have a conversation and perhaps contemplate and perhaps make a decision. You're going to shit or get off the pot. Make a decision about having kids on her accelerated timeline because you love her and want to be with her and are willing to make an adjustment to make that possible for you two to be together. Go knock that bitch up is basically my advice. I command you. Waiting till you're 40 and she's almost 40, even if she didn't have a medical condition, unreasonable. In this circumstance, asshole move. Don't be an asshole. Some people love to go grocery shopping. Are you one of those people? Me neither. That's why you should give Thrive Market a try. ThriveMarket.com can change the way you eat and shop. Thrive Market is the new convenient way to get the highest quality natural organic groceries like healthy snacks, supplements, and foods to stock your pantry at 25 to 50% less than even the discount stores. Thrive Market is like Costco meets Whole Foods online. Pay just 60 bucks a year and get wholesale pricing all year long. The average customer saves about $40 per order and Thrive guarantees you'll save more than your membership fee within your first two orders. In fact, they'll let you test drive the savings for free before you buy your membership. Thrive Market offers a lot of food, but they also have beauty and health products and hello, a whole intimate product section including condoms, lube, and massage oil. So, mm, yeah. Discover for yourself why 400,000 members believe in Thrive Market. And for every paid Thrive Market membership, a free membership is donated to a family in need in the United States, and that's just awesome. Test drive it for free for 30 days and get an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. That's an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. Dan, I am not sure why I'm doing what I'm doing, and I want to make sure I do it for the right reasons. I am being hit on by a man who has a mobility disability. He is extremely friendly and smart and has been straightforward and kind in asking me out. I'm disappointed in myself because I haven't given him a straightforward answer. I've been nice and I've been a friend, but I haven't really told him yes or no regarding romantic interests. I think that I am not attracted to him because of his disability. In a shallow sense, it's not as attractive as the more fit men who I usually can get interest from. I feel guilty that this is in my way and think if he didn't have a disability, I might go out with him. However, I think it could be worse if I said yes and allowed him to get his hopes up while I tried to engage in a relationship I don't have feelings for because I felt guilty because of his disability. I was born without a hand, so I have a disability as well. Perhaps he thought that would make me different than other guys that have rejected him. I am surprised by myself as well that even though I have a disability, I am turned off by someone else with a disability. My question is, is it wrong to go out with someone who you're pretty sure you won't develop feelings for just to be nice? Is it shallow not to be attracted to someone for a physical attribute that isn't their fault? Joining me by phone to help tackle this question, Andrew Gerza. He's a disability awareness consultant and a cripple content creator. His writing has been featured in Out Magazine, New Now Next, and Huffington Post. He's the host of the Disability After Dark podcast, the podcast shining light on sex and disability available on iTunes. Hey, Andrew, how you doing? Good, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. So quite a question. Took an unexpected turn there when... The guy admitted that he himself had a disability and so felt a little extra conflicted about the fact that 
it was this guy's mobility disability that was a turnoff for him that, that left him feeling not attracted to this guy. Is this common in the disability kind of community or world where disabled people also aren't willing to think about dating other disabled people? I think it is common. Yeah. I think it's something, it's, and it's something that's happened to me as a disabled queer person. Um, I have had the same experience where I've seen somebody with a disability and said, no, no, I don't think I would date them because they have a disability. And so I think it really speaks to a lot of internalized ableism that this, this caller may, may, have, been, may have been feeling mm-hmm. when he was approached by this guy. Internalized ableism. Can you unpack that term for people who may not be familiar with it? Yeah, so ableism is just the general discrimination of somebody with a disability, and then internalized ableism is where you take all those views on disability if you are somebody living with a disability and you turn them in on yourself. So you you feel bad about yourself because you're disabled. You feel like you shouldn't be disabled because you're disabled. All these things, mm-hmm. all these fe- feelings around disability, you turn it on yourself. You know, the, we talk a lot about internalized homophobia where people internalize the hatred, or gay people internalize the hatred directed at uh, queer people by the culture. And there's also all sorts of studies where a famous one of little uh, African-American girls who were given a choice between a white doll and a black doll and chose the white doll. And it was evidence of internalized sort of racial preferences or racial coding or racist beauty ideals or just ideal ideals. So this isn't just something that disabled people face. So many of us face this sometimes on multiple fronts, internalized uh, hatreds or or, or phobias or, or negative messaging about the people that we are ourselves. Exactly. And I think what this caller was experiencing, I mean, the call did take a really, a really sharp left turn there. I was surprised. I had to listen to it twice to be like, wow, because I wasn't expecting what he said about his, his disability. But it just shows how ingrained this idea of perfection is mm-hmm. in our mm-hmm. culture, especially within the LGBTQ culture. And so what this, what this caller may have been experiencing was He's looking for perfection because that's what he's been taught to to look for. And this person, may, this other individual that's approaching him, may be great. He may just need it. He may need time to get to know this guy, and he may genuinely not be attracted to him. But I think there is a lot of ableism that could play in here. And so you think, you know, one of his questions is: Is it wrong to go out with someone? Uh, that you're pretty sure you, you're not going to be attracted to or not catch feelings for just to be nice. And would your advice then be go out with the guy? Cause you don't know, maybe interacting with this guy, you will become attracted to him or overcome your internalized uh, ableism and something will click into gear. So do you think he should err on the side of going out with the guy, not just to be nice, but because there might be something there. I would say that, I mean, in either case, he could make a friend. He mm-hmm. could, he could, make a friend with a disability so they can talk about disability stuff together. Um, and if something did spark, great. But I think to deny him based on, based on the fact that he's disabled when the caller himself lives with a pretty significant disability is really kind of unfair. And I think he should consider going out with him just to see if at the very least there's a friendship there or not. But as a disabled person yourself, if you were out on a date with someone and you realized they were there just to be nice, that it was kind of a pity date, a pity fuck version of a date, would that upset you? Or would you think, well, at least they gave me a chance. At least they were open to a friendship, if nothing else. Or would you be upset? Would, would be pity fuck dating upset you? Well, I've been pity fucked before. Um, so, I mean, it is very upsetting. It is really upsetting. And I think if, if the caller is genuinely not attracted to this guy in any way, then he should maybe say like right up the bat, Hey, let's just go for coffee as friends. But I think it sounded like from his call, there may be, there may be some, some stuff there that he wants to explore, but he didn't quite know how to do that. So I think, if he really doesn't want to hang out with this guy and, and doesn't want it at all, he should say up front, like, I don't want to do this. This is not for me. But if he, if he wants to see where it can go, he should say, let's just go for coffee and see. Be really upfront about that, too, so that the person on the other end doesn't have any major expectations of falling in love and having this 
grand relationship mm-hmm. and just knows what he's getting into. Yeah, you always want to err on the side of not giving someone false hope because then the yeah. fall is much harder. Uh, and that applies just across the board. It's not just to this issue. Qu- let's quickly d- uh, dispense with his other question. And then I have a question for you from a friend uh, who I said, told him I was going to talk to you. And he actually wanted me to put this challenging question to you coming up. But this question, is it shallow not to be attracted to someone with physical attributes uh, that aren't their fault? And my answer would be not necessarily. I'm not attracted to women. Those physical attributes, not their fault is persons, but I'm just not attracted to women. Uh, maybe there's a point at which it becomes shallow, uh, but broadly and generally, is it okay not to be attracted to people because they have physical attributes that aren't their fault? I think it's okay. I, I do think it's okay. I think why I found, and I listened to the call, like I said a bunch of times to really get my head around it, why I found it troubling was because it was, that question was connected to the disability part, mm-hmm. and that's where I was initially like, oh, okay, that is that is slightly a problem for me and that he may not be. And this, I think he mentioned that like just before he mentioned that he was also disabled. So it was kind of jarring that he would say that. Like, what if the, what if the other party didn't like him because he had, he, he lacked a hand. So, I mean, I think that it's okay, but I think the way that it was connected to disability here kind of caught me off guard. But I think generally, yes, it's okay. But I think the way that it was connected here was, was shallow, really potentially. Yeah, and I do yeah, think that yeah. I, I do think that people need to be thoughtful about what you're attracted to and who you're attracted to and why, because a lot of times the things that we think we're attracted to are the things we've been told to find attractive, and if we really yeah. examine our prejudices around attraction, we may find that we're attracted to more and different types of people than we realized when we first began having sex or dating or coming out. You know, the range of guys I was attracted to when I was. 15, 16, 17, 18 years old and first coming out was a lot narrower than the range of guys I'm attracted to now. And it's because I wanted what I thought I'd been, to- I wanted what I'd been instructed by the culture to want, not just gay culture, but straight culture too. Like these were the kinds of guys who were hot and no other kinds of guys were hot. And that was a message that the exactly. culture sent, uh, you know, and I was steeped in heteronormative media at the time. So I picked up on that, even though it wasn't directly targeting me. And then along comes gay porn, along comes gay culture, which reinforces those same sort of types and preferences. And at a certain point, you have to step back and say, am I limiting myself here? Are, is, are these the guys I want? Or are these the guys that I've been told to want? Or the guys I think other people will be jealous of me if I have, because these are the guys everybody wants. And you'll find, I think, if you interrogate your desires in a thoughtful way, and this is just general advice for everybody, not just about disability, but also disability, that you are going to find yourself attracted to more people. And that means you will have more potential partners in a broader selection if you want just one person for your entire life a broader selection you know more to choose from when you're finding a person i mean exactly when i was coming when i was coming out and up until a point recently i was only i would say oh my my partner my sex partner has to be able-bodied because of x y reasons and because they can lift me out of my chair and i would make excuses for why they would have to be able-bodied and muscular and have all these reasons around my disability, why it was easier because they could take care of me, blah, blah. But what I was really doing was limiting myself to a really narrow stereotype of what I thought I wanted and not allowing myself to see past that. So even though I advocate for difference, there are moments where my internalized ableism plays into that homonormative idea of what I should be looking for. So here's the question from a friend who I said I was going to be talking to you, and he asked me to put this to you. And he's too embarrassed to call in uh, and ask this himself because he's worried about offending you. Um, But he's attracted to guys uh, because of their disability. Not despite, but because. He's attracted to certain kinds of disabled guys. Should he feel terrible about that? Is that fetishizing? As a disabled person yourself, you know there are people out there. I think it's called aficionados. There are people out there who are attracted to... Actually, it's called uh, devotees. Devotees. Sorry, a little brain fart there. Um, is that offensive to you as a disabled person or is there, can someone be attracted to people because they're disabled and still see them as people, not fetishizing them, not turning them into objects, but attracted them for this reason and able to be potentially a good partner and someone that a disabled person might want to date? I think you can. I think that, I think when I go out in the world and the way I have built my brand around disability and sexuality is to 
to use my disability as a selling point mm-hmm. and to play with it. And that's why I refer to myself as a queer cripple and a cripple content creator. I play with all that stuff and I make jokes about my joystick and I make jokes about all, like all that stuff to, to show that my disability is a part of the experience. I think where And a joyful part of your experience. Is, yeah. It's a, I mean, it's, there are positive, there are definitely positive parts of it, I'm, but what I try to do in my work is to talk about also, you know, the tough stuff, because there are moments where mm-hmm. being disabled and queer is not a happy time. So there, I think what, what I try to do is talk about all that stuff. But I think for your friend, you can be attracted to somebody because they're disabled. Where, where the issue is, is if you tried to disable me more in, in our relationship because you would go off on that, or if you mm-hmm. disabled me more during our sex because that was, you wanted to play play on that, or you you did something to only focus on the fact that I, that you were going to disable me to then save me as an able-bodied person or something. Mm-hmm. That's where the, the fetishizing part becomes a problem for me. I think to be attracted to somebody because they're disabled is kind of hard, actually. So I mean, I, I'm I'm okay with it as long as we discuss as you know the two people. Or, or multiple people discuss, you know, the boundaries and what that means for them. Great advice. Andrew Gerza, disability awareness consultant, cripple content creator. Check out his podcast, Disability After Dark Podcast, the podcast shining light on sex and disability. And follow him on Twitter, as I do, at Andrew Gerza. Hey, Andrew, thanks so much. It was really great talking to you. And I'd love to have you on again sometime. You're really good at this advice shit. Let's have you back. That sounds totally awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original shows, news, comedy, and more. Audiobooks are great to listen to when you're driving, on the subway or bus, doing chores around the house, or at the gym. For our listeners, Audible is offering a free 30-day trial. Just go to audible.com slash savage and browse their unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. A couple of audiobooks you might want to consider are Perv, the Sexual Deviant in All of Us by recent Savage Lovecast Magnum Edition guest Jesse Baring, and also Why is the Penis Shaped Like That and Other Reflections on Being Human, also by Jesse Bearing both great reads and you can have them read to you for free by going to audible.com slash savage to get your 30 day free trial. Once again, that's a 30 day free trial at audible.com slash savage. It's audible.com slash savage. Hi, Dan and the tech savvy at risk youth. I'm a 33 year old straight woman and uh, my husband is 35 and we've been together for about five years. Um, my question is about having mismatched libidos um, indirectly. So I've always had the higher libido, and we've talked about it several times over the years, um, usually initiated by me when I feel kind of rejected or, or insecure about not having sex for a while or whatever. Um, recently, we talked about, um, when we talked about it, he admitted to me that he wished that there were more of like a chase element to our sex life, like it were, he wished that it were harder work, more work for him to get me into bed. Um, so when he knows that I'm basically up for it at any time, whenever he is, obviously that takes the fun out of the chase element. Um, so my basic question is how can I turn up the chase factor with our sex life when we both know that I'm the one with the higher libido? What complicates this whole question is the fact that I'm almost eight months pregnant right now. We're both really happy about that. We're excited to have our first kid. My libido hasn't changed, um, but we have had sex less than ever during my pregnancy. I've tried to be fair to him and not bug him about it very much because I figure he's got a bunch of new things on his mind. Um, I don't necessarily feel my sexiest and my energy levels are frankly lower. And I also think ahead to life with a kid and I assume that having sex with my husband won't be as easy as it was before we have a kid. So the more complicated question is, um, how do I turn up the chase factor while I'm pregnant? (laughs) And also, you know, assuming that we're going to have a different kind of sex life after we have the kid. I think that my libido will probably always stay higher than his. And maybe the pregnancy thing is just something to see as just a temporary thing that, that will come back to some semblance of normal. The the overarching issue is the fact that I have a higher libido and he knows it, but I think he wants to be in a position where he can actually seduce me or or get me into bed without knowing that it's already a done deal. 
I want to give your husband the benefit of the doubt, but I'm going to unpack my doubts first. Sometimes people in this kind of relationship, this mismatch, where there is the person with the higher libido, the person with the lower libido, the person with the lower libido will tell the person with the higher libido that the reason that they're not having sex or as much sex as they could be having is that they're turned off because they know that the other person always wants it because there's no tension, there's no seduction, that they don't have to seduce the person, that they don't get to initiate themselves because you're always ready. And so they say, back off, you stop initiating, let me seduce you. And then what happens is even less sex than happening already, even less sex than happening right now, because they're not actually interested in having more sex than they're having or that they want to have. They're just interested in you shutting up and not pestering them anymore to have sex. It's not that they don't want you to initiate because it kills their libido. It's that they don't want you to initiate because they don't want to have sex, because they have a much lower libido than you do or, or no libido and they feel guilty every time you initiate and they don't want to have sex. They have to sort of confront the disconnect and the big problem in your relationship and it makes them feel guilty. So this is a way of getting you to shut up and go away. And it's kind of a libido shaming tactic that, oh, we would be having a lot more sex than we're having if only you weren't always ready. If only you didn't want to have sex. If only you weren't asking for sex. If only you weren't initiating, I would be initiating. Hey, you stop initiating. You stop wanting it and I'll want it. A lot of people in the low libido seat will throw this out there and then the person will stop initiating and then there will be less and less and less sex than there is already. So that's my doubt that your husband isn't being sincere when he says that there is this disconnect, that your libidos really don't fit together. And you know what? This disconnect was something that you guys should have taken into account or discussed or been able to articulate much earlier in the relationship because perhaps you weren't a match for a long-term sexually exclusive relationship, if this was the case, if the way your libido works kills his libido, yeah, maybe not a match. Maybe you ought to prioritize sexual compatibility before you scramble your DNA together and crank out a kid. But you didn't, and here we are. So what do you do? Now, giving your husband the benefit of the doubt, those were my doubts, here's the benefit of the doubt. This is how his libido works, and you know this now. Might have been better to know it then, but you know it now. How do you accommodate his libido without your sex life completely evaporating, which I'm here from the future of parenting to tell you it is going to completely evaporate for a while after your infant comes. Keep it mellow, lay back, you're both exhausted, masturbate together, look in each other's eyes, promise each other that when you're less exhausted, when the kid is less demanding, you will have a sex life again. You will not stew in resentment for how little sex you're having or that it's just masturbating and exhausted sex now because that resentment will kill it. For sure, later. Okay, but anyway, if what he says is true, the way your libido works kills his libido, how do you create accommodation? Where he knows that you're up for sex whenever, and so his powers of seduction aren't really required, how do you have sex that allows him to seduce in the context where you're always ready? Well, you make a game out of it. You agree for these weeks or this month that you're going to have sex, he's going to initiate, and... It's his job in this game to initiate at moments of inconvenience to you, 15 minutes before you have to be out the door to get to work or shows up at your work and you have to figure out a place to fuck the husband in the office, find a stairwell, find a single seater bathroom, whatever, or at a moment when you're really tired and want to go to bed and you're going to have plenty of those moments in the next year and a half, I promise you, those moments that he could press his advantage at those moments and attempt to seduce you when you're really not, perhaps not not wanting sex, because you always want sex, but it's not convenient for you to have the sex that you want right this second. Encourage him to find those right this seconds when it's not a good time for you and attempt to seduce you then. All of those attempts may not be successful because maybe you can't find a place at work to fuck. Or maybe you have to be out the door and fucking right this minute or a quickie isn't going to work for you. But there will be times when it is successful, times when he can nuzzle your neck long enough and say the right dirty words to get you to have sex at this inconvenient moment. Sex that you want because you always want it, but not sex when you want. That's the place where you can find that sweet spot where he is able to seduce. But there has to be compromise both ways where you are still allowed to initiate. You are still allowed to ask And if at times you are horny and he is not, he should be there for you, happy to hold you or play with your tits or cuddle you while you masturbate and 
use your Hitachi magic wand or whatever vibrator you happen to have by the side of the bed for those moments when you need to take care of yourself, that he can be there for you. And who knows, in those moments, often the low libido partner and the high libido partner agree that there are times when you're going to masturbate and I will give you a masturbatory assist. Sometimes a low libido partner catches a groove and suddenly wants to have sex and then is glad that they did. So you can make an accommodation that allows him to seduce. He can make an accommodation that allows you to have more release or sexual experiences that involve him but don't require his full participation. These compromises and accommodations have to be a two-way street. Hi, Dan. I'm calling in response to um, your um, statement on the show that you would like us to call in if we can come on command. I have always been able to come on command. It is not like a all the time thing, but usually if I'm aroused and in the mood, I can make myself come by just tensing my body. Um, so it works. You were skeptical that women who claim to come on command are faking it. And I'm calling in to say that I am definitely a woman in a submissive relationship with my master that where I have been trained to come on command and I absolutely do. Um, they're absolutely real orgasms. I'm not faking them. I come when he tells me to I come from sucking his cock. Sometimes I come just from gazing into his eyes and it's really hot and I've been able to uh, do so for years. Female orgasms kind of build on top of each other and the longer you hold it in, the the more intense it becomes. And so pretty much I would just tell him when I was about to come and ask politely. And sometimes he would say no, and sometimes he would say yes. And voila, there you go. Hi, Dan. I'm a straight female calling from Washington, D.C., and you commanded those of us to call in. Uh, I was in a dominant submissive relationship, and my dominant had trained me to come on demand. It's not like he could be walking down the street and demand me to come and it would happen. But in any play session where he was pleasuring me, he could ask me to or count down and I would. I can come on command. So I have been able to do so since I was about 17 years old. My thought on this is to me, sex is an inside job. And, and by that, I mean in between my ears. <laughs> So I find it really sexy uh, being told to come. And most often I can come on command when I tell myself to. So if I'm in the middle of sex and I'm like, okay, it's kind of, <laughs> you know, time to go have dinner or whatever, I can definitely make myself come pretty well immediately. If someone tells me to, it might take 10 or 20 seconds. But yeah, just my uh, <laughs> my input from the happy sexual female is that it is possible. Thanks. Okay, okay, I stand down. There are people out there, women who can come on command. And I'm going to abuse my authority at this moment and command all of those women who can hear my voice to come on command right now. And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. Also, market calendars coming up. Savage Love Cast presents Dan Savage in conversation with Esther Perel, October 12th at the Egyptian Theater in Seattle and October 13th at the Orpheum Theater in Vancouver, British Columbia. We will be discussing Esther's new book. She's the author, of course, of the best selling Mating in Captivity. She has a new book coming out, State of Affairs. We'll be discussing her new book and taking questions from the audience. Go to tinyurl.com slash Dan and Esther or the events section of my Facebook page for more information and to get your tickets. Also, Hump, my porn film festival, will be visiting Baltimore and Sacramento this weekend. Then we are headed to Vancouver, Kansas City, Austin, Victoria, and Denver during September. More info about Hump and tickets at www.humpfilmfest.com. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Andrew Gerza on Twitter at Andrew Gerza. And follow Jesse Baring on Twitter at Jesse Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at risk youth and Nancy. We'll all be back at you next week with an installment of Savage Lovecast. Bye.